Hi, this is Daryl Meyer from Keller, Texas. Today is Thursday, January 30th, 2014. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Forgive me today. <laughs> uh, it's a little cold here today. My downstairs heater is not working, so um, trying to stay warm. Uh, and yeah, sporting my team, Dallas Cowboys. Oh yeah, hadn't been to a Super Bowl in 18 years. Never mind. Um, let's get started. Let's have a look at some things going on today. Before we get into the news, I, I've, I'm just so curious what's going on with all this snow. I've had so many people send me videos uh, saying, hey, the snow isn't real. It's like plastic. We try to burn it. It doesn't melt. It has this weird smell. It's like toxic. And, you know, the first couple of videos I, I watched, I was like, okay, you know, I, I view things with an open mind, with a side of skepticism. Uh, but then I had some close friends send me texts and emails going, um, I tried it too. It's, it's true. This isn't a hoax. This is real. So I, I don't know how to answer the questions about the snow. Uh, I, I don't know if it's because of the Fukushima uh, nuclear radiation that could be in the air, in the atmosphere, or if it's because of chemtrails, or, you know, if it's some kind of man-made thing. I don't know, okay? So, um, just, just know and understand, we're going to see a lot of weird things prior to the return of Christ, okay? The Bible says it's going to be a time on the earth unlike any other that the world has ever seen or will ever see again. So we're going to see some strange things. Just be ready for that. Don't live in fear because of it, though, because fear is not from God. Fear is from the enemy. So stand on the firm ground of Jesus Christ. The Bible says God does not give us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. So don't let this world turn you away from the truth of Christ. Don't let anyone persuade you to chase after myths and fables, to turn away from the truth and follow after a lie. Okay? Stand on the rock. Build your life on the rock. That rock is Jesus Christ. Okay? So don't let anyone turn you one way or another. Um, again, I don't, don't know what all this snow is. Uh, Fortunately, I don't have any of it here uh, in the Dallas area. It's, it's cold, but I can handle cold. Um, anyway, let's have a look at a few things. Out of the Times of Israel, it says Iran can now build and deliver nukes, according to U.S. Intel reports. Iran can build and deliver nuclear weapons. Tehran has the capacity to break out to bomb if it wishes. Intelligence Chief James Clapper tells the Senate. <sighs> Iran now has the technical infrastructure to produce nuclear weapons should it make the political decision to do so. Director of National Intelligence James Clapper wrote in a report to the Senate Intelligence Committee published yesterday. He said it could not break out to the bomb without being detected. In the U.S. Intelligence Worldwide Threat Assessment delivered to the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, Clapper reported that Tehran has made significant advances recently in its nuclear program to the point where it could produce and deliver nuclear bombs should it be so inclined to do so. Keep in mind what they believe in Iran. They are Shiite Muslims, okay? They believe in this 12th Imam this Mahdi. They're Twelvers. Google Twelvers and see what they believe. They believe this 12th Imam who disappeared in a well in the ninth century, they believe he will make his appearance, but they also believe they have to create global chaos in order to usher him in. What better way to create global chaos than with some nuclear weapons, right? They also believe this Mahdi will be alongside Jesus, or Isa, as they call him in the Quran, which they deny his deity, they deny he's the Son of God, they deny he died on the cross, they deny he rose again from the dead. They believe this Mahdi will be alongside Jesus, or Isa, and will kill all the Christians and Jews, 
and spread Islam all over the world. That's what they believe. It's in their belief. It's in their Quran. It's in it's in the other uh, portions of their belief. That's what they believe. Now, the Sunni Muslims, by contrast, don't believe in this Mahdi. In fact, they don't believe it so much that they fight amongst themselves. Sunni and Shiite Muslims pretty much hate each other. <clears throat> Go figure. Um, <clears throat> I mean, that would that would kind of be like pre-trib believing Christians hating post-trib believing Christians to the point of killing each other. That's kind of how ridiculous it is. Anyway, <clears throat> it talks about Tehran has made this technical progress in a number of areas, including uranium enrichment, nuclear reactors, ballistic missiles, which it could draw from if it decided to build missile deliverable nuclear weapons. These technical advancements strengthen our assessment that Iran has the scientific, technical, and industrial capacity to eventually produce nuclear weapon. That makes the central issue its political will to do so. Interesting. Um, who do you think Iran would bomb first should they come up with these nuclear bombs? Many have said it would be Saudi Arabia to kind of get them out of the way, and then Israel. Who knows, though? Who knows? Um, I don't know if we'll see or ever know the answer to that question, or if Israel will strike them first. Keep in mind, Israel has struck uh, Iraq back in 1981. They struck their nuclear reactors, and also they hit Syria back in 2007. They hit their nuclear reactors. Israel has probably better intel on this than America does, would be my guess. And it wouldn't surprise me one bit if coming up on this first blood moon in the middle of April, if Israel wouldn't strike Iran by then. Something big is going to happen, I believe, when that first blood moon comes. Not sure what it is yet. Um, pretty sure it won't be plastic snow falling from the sky, though. Uh, again, strange things happening in these times. Here's something out of the blaze. Terror groups reportedly hiding missiles, military assets in apartment buildings, mosques, and water reservoirs. Islamist militants are using the cover of residential dwellings and civilian facilities, like water reservoirs, in which to hide their military assets in an effort to prevent future attack by the Israeli military, according to a senior Israeli official and an Israeli media report. Commander of the Israeli Air Force, Major General Amir Eshel, said yesterday that the Shiite terror group Hezbollah has placed thousands of military bases inside apartment buildings in Lebanon and that Israel would not be deterred from striking those buildings even if civilians end up being killed. That's kind of how Hamas, Hezbollah, Muslims operate. They hide behind the skirts of women and children. So when Israel does strike, then they can cry out, Oh, look, they're killing innocent women and children. That's their motive of operation. Um, Israel has pretty high intel on this. The Israeli Defense Forces Military Intelligence Chief Major General Aviv Kachavi said that 170,000 missiles and rockets are aimed at Israel right now. 170,000 missiles and rockets aimed at Israel right now. People, the Psalm 83 war talks about the enemies of God saying, Come, let us make sure the name of Israel is remembered no more. While you have people like the Palestinian Authority President, Mahmoud Abbas, passing out maps at UN General Assemblies showing all of the land of Israel to be covered in the name of Palestine, covering all the land of Israel, and Israel nowhere on the map. He's passing out maps like this the past couple of years at the UN meetings. The name of Israel to be remembered no more. You know, the devil hates God's chosen. The devil hates anyone that follows after Christ, the Jews and the Christians. The world seems to be coming against us even more every day. I'm okay with that. 
What can man do to me? If God is for me, who can be against me? <laughs> I'm prepared for battle. And I think every one of you should be as well. Because that battle is coming up. Here's a story out of the Times of Israel. Western Wall protest. End the peace talks at once. Hundreds gather at Jerusalem Holy Site to pray and rally against growing pressure to forfeit lands to Palestinians. Hundreds of right-wing demonstrators gathered at the Western Wall in the old city of Jerusalem today to voice their rejection of ongoing U.S. brokered peace talks between Israel and the Palestinians. The protesters called on the government to halt all negotiations with the Palestinians and to resist growing pressure to forfeit territories and evacuate settlements in the West Bank. Don't give away any of the land that God gave you, Israel. I hope when I go there in March, good Lord willing, that I'll be able to talk to some people in high positions. I, I do get to speak at the Knesset. I, I do get to speak to the IDF. I want to tell them, don't give away any land. God gave you that land. Who is man to force you to give away what God gave you? I say tell them no. You want some land? Go to one of the 57 Muslim countries and get some from them. Stop trying to divide God's land. You know, if you read the description in Genesis about the size of Israel, it's more like the size of Texas. It goes all the way to the Euphrates River. It covers parts of Egypt. Instead of that tiny little strip of land about the size of New Jersey they have now. So, a lot of people in Israel saying, don't give away any land. Stop the peace talks. Don't let John Kerry talk you into all this stuff. They're calling for the cancellation of these John Kerry edicts. Um, <clears throat> interesting. Ugh. I can't wait to go and talk to these people. Um, still hoping that God provides everything I need to get there. I'm confident and trusting that he will. You know, here we are, just a few days away from the Super Bowl, and I've got to say, I don't usually talk about my dreams in such a way, but the other night I had a dream about something horrible happening at the Super Bowl this year. I hope it was just a dream and nothing else. I have seen recently a few videos from people saying something is being planned. I don't know if I had that dream because of those stories or if I had that dream to confirm those stories. I don't know. Um, I hope and pray that everyone will be safe. I know there's many Christians on both teams that are playing. There will be many Christians in the stands. Let's talk about hopeful fans. In Zephaniah, I know, that's probably the part of your Bible that's got a bunch of sticky pages. Um, <laughs> In Zephaniah 3, verses 14 through 20, I'm not going to read all that, but it, it talks about, Sing, O daughters of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughters of Jerusalem. You know, in that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion. Let not thy hands be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly who are of thee, to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Um, I will gather you, for I will make you a name and praise among all people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. Every team, every professional sports team has this group of devoted followers, of faithful fans uh, I'm one. I've been a Dallas Cowboy fan since 1966. Okay, when I saw my first game that I remember at the age of three, yes, I do remember it. I I don't know if I have a, a just an odd memory or or what. I remember wearing diapers. Okay, my memory goes back really far in my early early childhood. Um. My mom used to have these gigantic needles that she would use, these pins, pinning my cloth diapers to me. Scared me to death. I always thought she was going to poke me with one of those, 
I remember that fear when she would open that thing up and I'm thinking it's the biggest needle I've ever seen in an area that's, you know, pretty sensitive. <laughs> yes, I remember that. But uh, these fans, these, these teams have fans. You've probably seen some of them in the news uh, this week, you know, Super Bowl week. Uh, some are very rabid fans. They're, they're, they're hateful when their team loses. They're, they're very joyful when their team wins. Um, I have to say I have mellowed out over the years. I used to get extremely angry when my team would lose. <laughs> um, sorry, uh, I've learned since to control that. Um, very happy when your team wins. I get that. I get that. You know, for, for fans, it's always, well, there's always next year, right? Uh, I've been saying that for 18, 19 years now. Um, anyway, Israel in the Bible had this unparalleled record of losing seasons, right? You know, dynasties flourished, nations grew and, and did well. Well, God's people experienced more losing seasons than winning seasons, right? Their continued existence was in itself a miracle. Even today, you know, someone might wonder how God didn't get tired of losing with his people. You know, he, he could have sold the team off long ago, you know, bought another team. Um, but God never gave up his franchise, his chosen people. The Bible says God made a covenant forever, a covenant of salt. When God makes a covenant forever, he doesn't go back on his word. There's a lot of people that say, oh, yeah, Israel's, the Jews, they're no longer God's chosen. The Christians are which is a replacement theology that's from the devil himself. The Jews and Israel will always be God's chosen land and God's chosen people. The Bible's very, very explicitly clear on this. If you believe otherwise, you're going against the word of God. Just saying. I'm going to go with God's word over man's word every time. Um, the people of Israel are his chosen people. He knew they'd win eventually. In fact, he's got a plan for them. It's pretty explicit in the Bible. Um, this message came to Israel through Zephaniah at a time when defeat was right at their doorstep. You know, he had joined these prophets of earlier who were predicting Israel's suffering. Zephaniah also added some words of hope. The reign of King Josiah included a season of righteousness in Judah that would delay God's judgment. The nation showed all the signs of a rebuilding year, okay? Uh, the people changed their old habits. They, they got rid of evil practices, idolatry, worship, all kinds of things. But Josiah's reforms didn't last very long. See, losing seasons ran very deep within the nation of Israel at that time. But hope became the refuge of this small group that was determined to remain faithful to God. God's hopeful, devoted fans. They realized that next year might not happen for a long time, but it would eventually come because God had promised. And when God makes a promise, he keeps it. The same God who kept his word to Israel keeps his promises to you and me today. Same God, yesterday, today, and forever, never changes you can count on God, always. So you can live as a hopeful fan, hopeful that his promises will come forth. Uh, God's promises describes both his relationship with Israel and the one that he longs to have with you and me. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you but will rejoice over you with singing, Zephaniah 3.17. So what does God want to accomplish in your life? Did you have a winning season or a losing season? If it was a losing season, maybe it's time for a little rebuilding. How do you rebuild? Well, you get rid of the old habits, the old ways of thinking, the old ways of life that don't work, and you replace them with righteous godly ways. And please don't 
misunderstand people. When when I'm when I'm preaching to you about how to live righteously, don't think that I have it all together. Don't think that I'm some kind of uh, holy, perfect man without sin. Okay, because best I'll ever be is a sinner saved by grace. You know, the Bible says all of our works are but filthy rags. And I get that. I understand that. But we should try and strive every day to be more like Christ. More today than we were yesterday. Serving with humble obedience to the one who gave it all up for us. Who suffered a horrible, painful death on the cross to save us. <laughs> Does your life reflect God's forgiveness? Acts 13, 38 in the New Living Translation says, Brothers, listen. In this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 4, 32 says, Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. The good news of the gospel of God's forgiveness is what our Christian testimony is all about. That includes forgiveness in our marriages. Um, there's, there's a great testimony of God's power when I forgive my wife as he has forgiven me. Nothing about our flesh wants to forgive. We want to hold on. We want to get revenge. We want to strike out, right? It's only through the work of the Holy Spirit that we're able to forgive just the way God has forgiven us. Forgiveness is a reality that comes from God Almighty himself. And only when you realize this truth can the Holy Spirit fill you with that kind of forgiveness to have for others. Isaiah, um, Isaiah 53. Let's go there. Sorry, I didn't mark it. I just remembered it. Um, Isaiah 53, I know it's here somewhere. Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquities of us all. Christ took on my selfishness. He took on my sins. He, he took on my unforgiving spirit on the cross. Jesus was pierced for my harsh words, for my wrongful attitudes with others, with my wife, with those that I love. He was crushed for our little white lies. He was bruised for our subtle dishonesties. He was crucified for our lustful, wicked thoughts. The Savior took on the punishment for every sin you've ever committed, every one you ever will, for neglecting your kids, for not honoring your wife or your husband. Because of Christ's forgiveness, my wife and I can proclaim it's possible to live in harmony with each other, to respect each other, to forgive each other. We're grateful to be able to proclaim God's work in our marriage, to be able to show to others that we forgive. We, we don't go to sleep with anger in our hearts. And that testimony can only be given through the Holy Spirit himself because our pl prideful, stubborn flesh can't take the credit for this. It's God alone. 
In Ezekiel 37, <clears throat> uh, 15 through 28 or so, uh, I'm not going to read it all. It says, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Thou son of man. Um, again, I'm not going to read it, but uh, verse 22 says, And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. And they shall no more be two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Um, God promised in this passage that the chosen descendants of David, the Messiah, would be the king over this newly reunited land, the, the northern and southern kingdoms. Why do Christians relate this prophecy to Jesus, despite the fact that he never held the earthly title of king? Well, you know, we know Jesus never aspired to be an earthly king. In fact, when a group of Jews wanted to make Jesus a king by force, he withdrew to a mountain, right, to avoid them in John 6, um, about verse 15 or thereabouts. Jesus very clearly said, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom's from another place. John 18, um, about verse 30. <laughs> ah, I have to look it up now, sorry. Um, sometimes you try to go by memory and I just want, I never want to misrepresent the word, okay? I never want to tell you the wrong scripture. If I say something is in a certain passage, I want to confirm it. So let's check out John 18. Um, 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Okay. So, um, it's from another place. It's, it's this heavenly kingdom, a, a place where every believer will one day reside in fellowship with God, the father. It's, it's a place where God's laws will be perfectly enforced, where, where Jesus will reign as king of kings. He says in Revelation that those who follow after him will reign as priests and kings. So there will be a bunch of kings that are reigning under King Jesus. So that title, King of Kings, will be very appropriate. A lot of people always thought, oh, King of Kings means he's, he's the, the, the top king. Yes, that's true. But he's the king of all of us kings, us little kings that are serving under him. That's what that name truly means, king of kings. Jesus knew that after this, this life on earth that he had returned to his heavenly throne to sit at the right hand of God the Father. He knew. He knew uh, where he would reign forever as the unchallenged king. Look in Matthew 26, verse 64, Acts 2, verses 32 through 35, or thereabouts. And one day, every knee will bow. Everyone will recognize his supreme kingdom nature that, that is his, and they'll submit to his authority. Everyone will acknowledge him as Lord. Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. I mean, he already rules and reigns as the royal king over millions and millions of people who have given their lives to Christ and who serve him obediently. <sighs> can't wait for that day. I, I can't wait when suddenly everyone will know that, yes, Jesus is king of kings. Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 10. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm not going to read this all either. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. It's grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know this passage. We have a God we can count on. We can rely on him. God's character doesn't change. Okay, God loves us unconditionally. Even... As we were yet sinners, God loved us. John 3, 16, the most famous scripture in the entire Bible. For God so loved 
the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life. He sent his son to die in our place. That proves his love for us. He'll love us forever. Psalm 100, verse 5. 1 John 4, verse 10. God will help us to do whatever it is he requires of us. If God brings you to it, he's going to bring you through it. Okay? He provides not only the, the spiritual wisdom to carry out whatever task he's placed upon you, and we receive from him everything we need. Hebrews 13, verse 21. I've learned to count on this more and more lately as, as the real estate market doesn't seem to be getting that much better for me. Um, God will help limit the temptations and, and the pressures in our lives. He knows what force needs to be applied to us to shape us into the image of his son Jesus with, without breaking us. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 8. God strengthens us and he protects us so we don't have to compromise our faith or, or give in to world pressures. He knows we're weak. The flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. He, he understands how strong we can be when he sends his divine power to work in us. And the Holy Spirit gives us the spiritual strength to say no to temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And he will forgive our sins. He's ready at all times to receive our confession, to receive our repentance, to bring us back into fellowship with him every time. 1 John 1 verse 9. We also have assurance of the future. You know, we can trust that life doesn't end when our earthly body dies. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8, that we'll live in heaven forever with Jesus Christ and we'll return one day to set everything right so that all these lies will be laid bare and everyone will know Jesus is exactly who he said he was. Can't wait for that to happen. You know, it, it, it's time to shine our light in this dark world. Matthew 5, 14 through 15, You are the light of the world, Jesus said. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people put a, a light under a lamp or put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. You know, I've had the good fortune of living both on the East Coast and on the West Coast. And I've had <laughs> uh, the ability to go to lighthouses and, and take tours of lighthouses. Very, very interesting places. Um, I, I think it's, it, it's kind of a very powerful image of what it means to be the light of the world. Uh, an effective witness for Christ. Uh, because you don't see lighthouses like in the middle of the cities, uh, far inland, you know, where where their light would just kind of be drowned out by all the other city lights. But you always find them on these dangerous coastlines uh, in very harsh conditions most of the time where their job is to help lead people to safety or warn them of the dangers. That's a very appropriate description of what we're to do with our light, that light that is within us. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And since he's in us, his light should shine forth from us. And as a believer in Christ, God hasn't called you to just huddle up in some holy huddle with the rest of the believers in church on Sunday. He's called you to go out to boldly step forth and proclaim the word of God, to risk safety and comfort and even life itself for the purpose of letting your light shine where it's needed the most in some of the darkest places of this world. Be bold. Onward, Christian soldiers. Boldly proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't just hang around Christians with when your little group at church on a Sunday for an hour. Get out in the world. Take risks. Be bold for Christ. Bring the good news of the gospel of Christ to others, people that need to hear it. Be a true light in this dark world and shine the light of Christ in you, the hope of glory, so people will come to know your Father. Mm. Matthew 6, 22 and 23, the light of the body 
is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. You know, God says, take no thought for tomorrow. Be careful for nothing. Mammon, or money, says, look ahead, be careful for everything. Invest, do this, do that. God says, give of thy substance to the poor, but mammon says, hold on to everything. It's that giving that spoils everything. We've all had this issue. I've had it. I've, I've been in a, a job for 22 years that's commission only. I don't have a steady paycheck. Uh, there's some months I have plenty, some months I have none. And <laughs> in those tight months, it's like, ooh, how am I going to pay the electric bill if I give away all the last money I have? I've noticed <laughs> this past year, I, I think I've given away close to half of my income to other ministries, to um, help advance the Word of God, spending it on traveling to places to preach the good news. And sometimes when I look at what came in, I wonder, how am I even getting by? <laughs> and it's all God. It's all God. He's teaching me more and more to live by faith. Um, we need to set our eyes on things above, not things on this earth. We need to take our eyes off our bank accounts and put them fully on God Almighty and trust that He will do what He said He will do. Um, mammon and God are such extreme ends of the earth and, and so completely opposed that I trust we would be foolish if we tried to serve them both. Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon, for you'll love the one and despise the other. Hmm. So, we need to know who it is we trust. <clears throat> Everlasting life, or eternal life. You ever consider these, these phrases? John 17, 3 says, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I think in order to, to completely understand what eternal life is, it might help us to know what it's not. Um, eternal life is not living forever, okay, in the flesh. Uh, some of the oldest people in the Bible, and Methuselah was 969 years old. No one hit a thousand years. I think that's... That's, that's very important. I mean, you think back then, yes, the air was pure. There was not pollution at all. No diseases. You know, not the kind of world we live in today. And probably God loved them so much he didn't want to see them die. It's like my new creation. A thousand years is like a day to God, the Bible says in Peter. Um, but I also think it's because in the millennial reign of Christ on earth, there will be people who hit that thousand year mark. There will be. Think about it. You know, if you're 40 or 50 when Christ returns and there's a millennial reign and you live with Christ for a thousand years, you're gonna pass a thousand years on this earth. <laughs> you thought you had wrinkles now, right? <laughs> Can you imagine a thousand year old? Well, in the perfect reign of Christ, it, it probably wouldn't be as bad as we're thinking. But, um, <coughs> Everyone will live forever in either heaven or hell. But eternal life is not living forever in the blessings of heaven as opposed to being tormented in hell. That's not eternal life. That's eternal torment in hell. Uh, there's a difference. John 3.36 and John 5.24 show us that eternal life is a present tense possession of the believer. Present tense. Jesus defines eternal life as knowing God the Father and Jesus Christ. So the word know is speaking of intimacy instead of just mere intellectual knowledge. Okay, So eternal life is having this intimate fellowship and this personal relationship with God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son. Um, John 3.16, this intimacy with God is what salvation's all about. It's yes, forgiveness of sins is, is not the point of salvation. I, I think this fellowship with God is this this intimacy with God. I mean, Jesus died to purchase forgiveness of our sins because 
sin was what separated us from God in the first place. Sin built this huge wall between us and God. And Jesus came and <laughs> smashed that wall down. He took it down. Sin was that obstacle between us and God. It had to be dealt with. And it was on the cross. When Jesus said, it is finished, everything that was necessary for our salvation has been completed and done. Anyone who looks at salvation as only forgiveness of their sins and stops there is missing out on eternal life, everlasting life. Salvation is intended to be the way to come back into harmony, into fellowship with God Almighty. But a lot of times it's presented in this way to, to just escape the problems of this life and, and to escape the, the judgment of hellfire. I think non-believers are probably so preoccupied with their hell on earth that they don't really care about their eternal future or even know about it. You know, a lot of non-believers think, oh, you know, this life, you die, you're done. You're like roadkill. You know, there's nothing else. That's it. Sadly, that's what a lot of people believe. They don't know there's another life, an eternal life. They're so fed up with Religion and people like me trying to lead them to the cross of Christ, out of the darkness and into the light, they're looking for something else that'll fill that emptiness inside them, whether it's money, drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever. But only an intimate relationship with God the Father can help you find eternal life. Do you have it? Do you know Him? Do you know Jesus Christ as Lord, Savior, and King? I promise you this. One day... Every knee will bow to King Jesus. Every knee. Truth. Word of God. Be bold. Get out there. Get off the bench. Speak some truth. Because it's time that God has a winning season. God bless you guys. Good Lord willing, I'll see you again tomorrow.